Usaka Sakabo, and welcome to Taino Library's first read aloud. The book that we're going to be reading is Caciques and Semi Idols, the web spun by Taino rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver. We're going to go ahead and skip the copyright information, table of contents, and all that jazz and jump right into part one titled Introduction and Theoretical Premises. And what you see on the screen is page three of the book, and um, it's the introduction to part one. So let's go ahead and get started. In this book, I will be exploring the underlying social significance of the spatial distribution of a class of religious portable artifacts, semis, that the Tainos and other natives of the Greater Antilles regarded as numinous beings and believed to have supernatural magic powers. A more precise definition of semi will be provided later. To understand the distribution of semi-idols requires a close look at the relationship between human beings and other non-human beings that are imbued with semi-power. I will be exploring inter-island interaction through the web of human and semi-idol relationships that was spun within the Taino cultural sphere, most specifically between Puerto Rico and Hispaniola. I will explore not only the inter-insular inter relationships in which semis and humans acted, but also where all interaction begins at the personal face-to-face -face level between persons and semi-idols. The material evidence comes from a selection of archaeological artifacts largely held in museum collections. The evidence for the interpretation of human and semi-interactions emerges from a critical review of the 16th century Spanish ethno-historic documents and, most particularly, from the famous Relación acerca de las Antigüedades de los Indios, written by Fray Friar Ramón Pané in 1497-1498, on orders of Christopher Columbus. Although objects imbued with semi-potency are quite diverse in material, form, and style, I'll be focusing on four broad formal categories. Number one, the large, highly decorated three-pointed stone sculptures, two, the large stone heads, three, stone collars, and four, elbow stones. A fifth category, the goisas, or face masks, will also be highlighted, as they provide a fascinating contrast to the other four categories, especially the stone heads. The first four classes of iconic artifacts are endogenous Caribbean creations for which there are no firmly established homologues or antecedents in the American continent. They are of interest because their spatial distribution is restricted to southeastern Hispaniola, Mona Island, Puerto Rico, Vieques Island, and the Virgin Islands, although a few rare, large, three-pointed Three-pointers did spread farther south into the Lesser Antilles, as far as the Grenadine Islands. In contrast, the spatial distribution of the Guaisas extends beyond the frontier of the so-called classic Taino cultural area. As Jeffrey Walker pointed out, there seems to be a codependent relationship between the massive and decorated three-pointers, stone collars, and elbow stones. So it's possible that these three artifacts may have spread as a set rather than as separate items. The geographical distribution of all four objects is much more restricted than the maximum re regional extent of what has been called the classic Taino culture area, that is, by the archaeologically and normatively defined distribution of the late Chican Austinoid series of cultures. Various other portable and powerful artifacts have a wider distribution throughout the Antilles than the four classes mentioned, such as the Guaisas worn on the chest, belt, arm, or forehead, Dujos, which are seats or benches, wooden figures or statuettes, inhalators for hallucinogen, hallucinogen snuffing, and above all, a myriad, a myriad of elaborate pendants and plaques for body adornment. The geographical circumscription of the aforementioned four classes of semi-artifacts centered between East Southeastern Hispaniola and Puerto Rico suggests two things. One, that there existed a shared tradition in each island region of manufacturing these particular classes of semi-icons, and two, that there existed a tight, reinforced, socially driven web or network through which these icons circulated and were inherited. This distribution of artifacts also suggests that the so-called classic Taino natives did not all share or construct in the same way their identity or their quote-unquote Taino-ness. As will be argued shortly, Taino is best approached as a spectrum or mosaic of social groups with diverse expressions of Taino-ness, not all of whom were Taino peoples in the conventional or standard sense provided by Irving Rouse and others. In this book, I will analyze the political, religious significance of the semi-objects and their distribution.
I will also focus on the relationship between the icons and human beings and the various contexts in which these relationships were enacted. In doing so, the scale at which interactions take place is also considered ranging from intimate face-to-face or person-to-person relationships to the broader, regional, inter-insular relationships of human interaction. The diverse semi-idols were central to the exercise of native political power and as such were seen as a direct threat to the hegemony of the Spanish conquerors. At the same time, however, these pwned objects were literally allies in the resistance put up by the native leadership against the onslaught of Christendom with their icons of saints and virgins. The struggle of the Antillian natives was in many ways a battle for the rule and survival of semi-idols. The War of the Region of Higüey in Hispaniola and the rebellion of the caciques or chiefs in Puerto Rico provide the context in which to analyze the intertwined human and semi-relations, offering valuable insights on the consequences of Spanish colonization. Yet, at the same time, the significance of appropriation and empowerment with regard to semis will also be studied. This is the case of a Cuban cacique with the adopted Spanish name of Comendador, who appropriated a Catholic icon and used it as he would have used a semi in order to engage in a ritualized combat against the rival cacique who was quote-unquote protected by his own semi-icon, an example of the initial process of Catholic syncretism with echoes of Tainones that survived into the 18th century in the cult of the Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre and the Virgen de Guadalupe. These and other accounts dealing with resistance and syncretism will be explored in part five of this book. Before the iconoclastic conflicts can be discussed, and before the relationships between semi-idols and natives can be analyzed, it's imperative to provide a critical review of what is meant by Taino, singular, since it is given as the culture and language of the natives in the Greater Antilles, and to also re-examine what's implied by Taino, plural, since it refers to individuals and the people who created, gave meaning, and used the semi-idols. Chapter 2, Believers of Semiism, Who Were the Tainos and Where Did They Come From? This section serves as a background on Greater Antillean archaeology so as to contextualize in broad strokes the potent semi-objects and to identify again in broad strokes the people who interacted with them. It is not an easy section to write because in the last few years our understanding of who the Tainos and their historical antecedents were have changed and continue to change dramatically. So much so that the 2000 annual meeting of the Society of American Archaeology in Vancouver is devoting a whole symposium to this topic, aiming at reaching some consensus on the matter. This section is also difficult to write because if, quote unquote, Taino is, in essence, an inoperative term that refers to nothing of real substance, then what term should archaeologists use in colloquial speech to refer to the spectrum of, quote unquote, peoples inhabiting most of the Greater Antilles? It will not do to forward a long phrase or sentence full of conditional statements to replace the term Taino. The native informants encountered by Fray Ramon Pané in Hispaniola spoke two different languages, two distinct languages, sorry. The Macorish language, about which we only know a few words, and the widely spoken dominant and elegant Taino language. The latter is a member of the northern Maypurin subfamily that is that in turn is grouped in the vast Arawakan linguistic stock spread throughout lowland South America. The natives inhabiting most of the Greater Antilles have been and are still labeled as quote-unquote Tainos ever since the term was first coined by Constantine Samuel Rafinesque in 1836. The Tainos are assumed to have shared a homogenous culture and language. The term ni Taino from which quote-unquote Taino derived refers to an elite stratum or class and not to an ethnic group. Moreover, not a single 16th century Spanish document ever used this noun to refer to the tribal or ethnic affiliation of the natives of the Greater Antilles. True, the term teno, meaning good or prudent, was mentioned twice in a short account of Columbus's voyage by his physician, Dr. Alvarez Chanca, in a very specific context while in Guadalupe. This was a response to the Spaniards from natives of Boriqueng, who had been captured by the so-called Caribs of Guadalupe, and who wished to escape on Spanish ships in order to return home to Puerto Rico. In other words, with this term, they were effectively saying something like, we are the good, prudent guys, unlike those others. 
After this singular mention, the term was not to be used again until the end of the 19th century, first by Daniel Britton in 1871, but only to refer to a linguistic classification and then, as noted, by Raffinesque in a broader cultural sense. The Spanish simply referred to them as Indios, Indio de Geta India Occidentales, or Indians of the West Indies. In the Repartimiento and Encomienda systems, forms of forced labor and slavery, the natives were listed as being such and such, personal names or titles, who belonged to this or that place, toponyms, examples like Juanillo de Caguana, Cacique de Caguas, or who belonged to this or that cacique, example, Isabel Cayaguash de Humacao. Besides, quote-unquote, indios, there are very few other terms written by the Spaniards that refer to collectivities. There is, of course, the name Luqueyo for the Indians of the Bahamas. This term is a compound of Lucu or loco, meaning person, in singular, and queyo, which means island. Thus, in answer to Christopher Columbus's questions, the Bahamian native, in effect, said he was a person of the island, that is, an islander, an excellent self-designation, but hardly an identification of membership in a given polity or larger ethnic group. Other designations were given by natives to other natives, such as Ciguayo and Hispaniola, which makes reference to their particular hairstyle gathered at the back of the head in a ponytail fashion, or Sibone, a term that the Spaniards claimed was given to a people from central to eastern Cuba who, to the Spaniards' eyes, were less developed than those originating from Hispaniola. Another term, Macorish, plural Macorilles, was given to natives who inhabited a region of that name in northern, e northeastern Hispaniola who spoke a non-Taino language and who also had a Cigüeyo-like hairstyle. In sum, the terms of reference and self-designation that natives use relative to ever higher levels of inclusion, from person to household and from local place level to larger social aggregates and polities, remain unknown. What is clear, though, is that a plurality of social groupings existed, cross-cutting both linguistic boundaries and political allegiances, and originating from diverse traditions and places. A. Rouse's Standard Cultural History, A Brief Overview. The late Irving Rouse is recognized as one of the leading figures in the development of cultural history and archaeology in the Americas, and has had a lasting international impact on how scholars and the general public perceive the pre-Columbian history of the Caribbean and of the Tainos of the Spanish contact period. As Reniel Rodriguez Ramos, Joshua Torres, and I noted recently, most, archaeologi most archaeologists working in the Caribbean, quote, have assumed the premises of Rouse's model in a quasi-religious fashion, merging culture and society into a single domain and considering that these have changed concomitantly along a unilinear temporal vector, end quote. Because it is Rouse's version of what the Taino are and how they emerge that prevails in the Caribbean, this section focuses on a critique of his assumptions. Within a classic cultural historic paradigm, Rouse defined three Taino culture areas based on the distribution of diagnostic features. The Western Taino, which encompasses most of Cuba, Jamaica, and the Bahamas, the classics, or central Taino, covering Hispaniola and Puerto Rico, and the eastern Taino, extending from the Virgin Islands and those north of Guadalupe. This core periphery spatial model is in many ways impressionistic. It is based on what Rouse regards to be manifestations of higher level, elaborate artistic achievements at the core, classic or central, versus the much more impoverished achievements of peripheral Taino, eastern and western. Earlier, Rouse had used the term sub taino to express the notion of underdevelopment or marginality. The more politically correct geographical designation, Eastern and Western, cannot hide that these variants of Taino are still grounded on notions of substandard achievement in comparison to the core area. For Rouse, the, quote, Taino people who greeted Columbus, end quote, were the culmination of a process of continuous historic divergence from a single phylum, from a common ancestral culture. For Rouse, all closely related styles that shared a set of ceramic norms or a modal complex are indicative of a common ancestral style and hence form a series of styles. In principle, all of the norms shared between closely related styles would be elicited from the set of diagnostic modes characterizing the posited ancestral style 
much in the same way that historical linguists reconstruct proto-languages on the basis of a shared or cognate lexicon, phonemes, morphemes, words, found in a set of living or recorded languages. Rouse's, quote, series, end quote, is archaeology's analog of the linguist's proto-language. By 1980, Rouse introduced the sub-series, an intermediate taxonomic level between style and series. This taxon was introduced by Rouse via suggestion from the late Gary S. Vassilius to acknowledge that within a series, a subset of styles appears to share more norms, modal complex, among themselves than with other members' styles of that same series. Thus, their divergence from the positive ancestral style, or series, was more recent. To distinguish a series from a subseries, Rouse added the suffix oid, example austenoid, to the former, and an, example austonian, to the latter. Differences between styles of the same subseries and series were primarily the result of cultural divergence or fission, a process that Rouse identified as analogous to biology's founder's effect. After fission, daughter communities will carry only a part of the parental genetic stock, i.e. a part of the parental norm and modes that make up a style. Rouse, like Gordon R. Willey, was a great synthesizer. He, his description of the entire development of history of the Tainos takes but one paragraph. All the historic age Tainos made pottery belonging to a single Austonian series of local styles. The ancestry of the classic Tainos can be traced back into prehistory through a Chican Austenoid subseries. The ancestry of the Western Taino through a Meilakan Austenoid subseries. The ancestry of the Eastern Taino through an Elenin Austenoid subseries. The three ancestries converge in the Sidrosin Saladoid subseries of Puerto Rico and the Lesser Antilles. From there, the trail leads back to similar deposits on the Guianan and Venezuelan coasts. In other words, the cultural traits of the Taino peoples and their regional variants, Western, Eastern, Classic, or Central, all derive from the spread of the Saladoid series of peoples and their ceramic styles from their original homeland in the Orinoco Valley, reaching the West Indies between circa 400 to 250 BC. In Rouse's model, the Lesser Antillean or Torioid series of cultures, archaic age, were either quickly decimated or rapidly acculturated to the civilizing forces of the advancing Sidrosan Saladoids, who brought and imposed a sedentary lifeway, ceramic technology, and a subsistence based on agricultural production to the, quote, hapless, end quote, nomadic bands of hunter-gatherers. Even in Hispaniola, where Rouse recognized a greater degree of interaction between the archaic populations, El Porvenir and Curi cultures, and early Austenoid cultures, Anadel and Macadi cultures, spread out of Puerto Rico, the effect was the same. The archaic hunter-gatherer groups became very rapidly Austenized, i.e. Rouse's Mejican, Mejakin subseries. The presence of non-Saladoid and non-Austenoid pottery in archaic sites such as El Caimito and El Porvenir in southern Hispaniola and of Caimanes III in Cuba for Rouse were essentially a brief instance of copying Saladoid ceramic technology, not the style, even when the dates cited, circa 400 to 300 BC, are more than three centuries older than the earliest Saladoid presence in Hispaniola or Mejican in Cuba. Apologies for mispronouncing some of these words. Moving on. In any event, the archaic cultures with pottery in Hispaniola were also to perish under the weight of colonization by the early Austenoids, that is, the direct descendants of the Saladoids. These were the early Austonian Austenoid cultures, Ostions to Arroyo del Palo, that spread from Puerto Rico westward into Hispaniola, the Bahamas, eastern central Cuba, and Jamaica, starting around AD 600. Only the westernmost region of Cuba was spared. Rouse argued that at the time of Spanish contact, western Cuba was entirely inhabited by hunter-gatherer bands designated as Guanajatabes or Guanajagabibes. In the 16th century, these bands were described as troglodytes or cave dwellers, 
who lacked agriculture and settled village lifestyles, a description that fostered the illusory image of a surviving archaic population that remained culturally ossified in time. The implication of Rouse's developmental scheme is that the Taino religious ideology and ritual paraphernalia were, in effect, the result of inheritance and subsequent local innovations from the single ancestral Sidrosan saladoid source. The archaic hunter-gatherers had nothing of substance to contribute to the emergence and coalescence of the latter Taino culture. This view has also resulted in the use of ethnohistory analogy and archaeological comparisons with northeastern South America to the exclusion of other areas of continental America, such as the Isthmian region of Panama and Colombia or the southeastern United States, the Gulf Coast. Julian Stewart's original definition of a circum-Caribbean culture area was reduced to the Caribbean islands and northeastern South America by Rouse. Rouse treated religion and its paraphernalia in the same typological fashion as he did ceramics and other artifacts. In his last synthesis, Rouse approach to, Rouse's approach to religious artifacts had not changed much from his earlier writings. In his only explicit paper on the development of religion in the Greater Antilles, Rouse wrote in the mid-1980s, quote, The ceremonial artifacts of the Greater Antilles are as complex and variable in their stylistic attributes as the pottery. These objects were presumably used to worship the deities that historic Taino Indians called semis. They are representative of a religion called semiism. Until recently, religious objects were found only in sites dating from periods 3B, which is A.D. 900 to 1200, and 4, A.D. 1200 to 1524. Now, however, similar ceremonial objects are turning up with Hacienda Grande, the earliest saladoid style in Puerto Rico, end quote. For Rouse, the Taino ceremonial artifacts are related to the, quote, worship of the deities, end quote, that is, semi-icons, who are not deities anyway. He argued that semi-objects developed from a single ancestral saladoid source and therefore religious art went through a, quote, dark age, end quote, only to undergo a revival later. Quote, it is beginning to look as though we may distinguish two climaxes of religious art in the Antilles, one known as Igneri, from the island Carib word Eyeri, meaning man slash husband, during period 2A, which is AD 300 BC to AD 400, and the other known as Taino, during period four, which is A.D. 1200 to 1524. The two are comparable to the classic and post-classic stages in nuclear America. They are separated by a dark age, like that between the classic and Renaissance art in Italy. Rouse goes on to argue that the spatial distribution of Taino art supports his hypothesis of a religious revival out of the preceding quote-unquote dark ages, the latter represented by the Elenin Austinoid and Austonian Austinoid cultures and styles. This purported Taino Renaissance, quote, reached its highest development in the Mona Passage area and is much the same on both sides, end quote, on the Eastern Dominican Republic and Western Puerto Rico. However, Rouse says, quote, the art, the art objects became similar and less typical as one proceeds through the Windward Passage area into the Western periphery, Western Taino, and through the Vieques Sound area into the lesser, lesser Antilles, Eastern Taino, end quote. And he concludes that, quote, the development of ceramic styles parallels that in ceremonial art, end quote. Although in this article, Rouse did not include a discussion of the Archaic Age, it's clear from his 1992 synthesis book that the entire corpus of semiism and the religious or ceremonial artifacts, and hence ideology and practice, evolved from the Sidrosan Saladoid or Igneri art. It is striking that after reading Rouse's 1992 book, one comes to the conclusion that the diverse archaic cultures whose ancestors had been inhabiting the Caribbean islands since around 5,000 to 4,000 BC have contributed very little, if anything, to the emergence of Taino culture, especially regarding religious beliefs and practices. B, from a unilinear ancestry to multiple authors and ancestries. Needless to say, Rouse's unilinear developmental culture history is seriously flawed. The following critique focuses on Puerto Rico, and it is here where Rouse first began in 1937 his construction of the cultural chronological 
model and is also where the archaeological data is denser and better document, documented. To begin, to begin with, the diverse archaic populations substantially contributed to the cultural patterns and social configurations, not to mention the material culture of the societies and cultures that Europeans encountered from 1492 onward. The two archaic series noted by Rouse are likely to have originated from two different continental regions. The Casmiroid and all of its variants, such as Seboruco, are said to have come from the so southern Yucatan Peninsula, especially Belize, in Central America, and spread through Cuba eastward, while the Austinoid, others call it Banwaroid, originated in the Trinidad Perea Peninsula, Venezuela region, and spread northward throughout the Lesser Antilles. Surely, the groups from each of these two different continental regions brought with them different bodies of knowledge and material culture to the Caribbean. Maritime voyages back and forth from the Caribbean islands to the homeland and also from and to various other continental areas in the Circum-Caribbean, like the Isthmus of Panama and Colombia, continued to be undertaken long after the initial colonization. Rouse recognized only a single archaic culture for Puerto Rico, Corozo, Arteroid series. He admitted, however, that there were casmory contacts between the Dominican Republic, example, Curi, and Puerto Rico, example, Cerrillo site in Cabo Rojo. It is clear now that a growing number of archaic complexes do not neatly fit a single Corozo cultural pattern or Amili Corozo with some influences from Hispaniola. A suite of 60 absolute dates related to the to archaic or pre-Arawak sites not only shows an initial occupation around 4000 BC Angostura site in Vega Baja, much earlier than Rouse admitted, example, Corozo complex at 1000 BC, but also persisted for much longer until at least AD 400. This implies that the later archaic populations coexisted with the so-called Hacienda Grande, i.e. Cedros and Saladoid and La Jueca cultures for some eight centuries. 400 BC to 8400, more than ample time for all kinds of social interaction and exchanges to develop. Detailed analyses of archaic lithic complexes undertaken by Rodriguez Ramos demonstrate that the reduction protocols to produce a variety of implements were quite different from those of Hacienda Grande, Cedros and Saladoid. On the other hand, whoops, go back up. Sorry about that, guys. On the other hand, the reduction sequences recorded for the non-saladoid La Hueca and Punta Candelero or Huecoid complexes are essentially derived from the archaic assemblages, the protocols of reduction, and the resulting functional and former tool types developed by the archaic over several millennia were adopted by the non-saladoid La Hueca and Punta Candelero groups in Puerto Rico, but not by groups producing and using Hacienda Grande style pottery. As was first proposed by Luis Chanlate Baic, it was from the archaic and huecoid that the early Austonian populations inherited a lithic technology that would continue evolving until the Spanish contact period. The differences in lithic technology between saladoid and huecoid point to significant differences in how these populations interacted with the contemporaneous archaic populations. The La Hueca culture, first found on Vieques Island, presented a serious problem to the cultural chronological edifice erected by Rouse. In essence, Rouse interpreted La Hueca and other related complexes, mainly Punta Candelero on Puerto Rico, Hope Estate One in St. Martin, and possibly Moral One in Guadalupe, as cultures that derive from a common saladoid background and thus place them in a different subseries, the Huecan saladoid. A careful reanalysis of all data, however, indicates that La Hueca, Punta Candelero, Hope Estate 1, and Morel 1, and others found in Puerto Rico, are best treated as separate and distinct from the saladoid complexes. Differences are found not only in the decoration of their ceramics, example, emphasis in zoned incised decorations as opposed to white on red, but also in their respective vessel form sets. As Rodriguez Ramos demonstrated, the lithic reduction protocols of the La Hueca and Punta Candelero assemblages are also very different from those of Hacienda Grande and other Cedrosan solidoid lithic assemblages. If anything, Rouse should have placed the La Hueca and related complexes in a separate Huecoid series rather than within a Huecan subseries of the Saladoid series. <laughs> 
the distinctiveness of the Huecoid styles points to a separate ancestry or developmental history from that of the Cedrosan solidoid. Its origin is still debated. Some suggest a Colombian Isthmian, others a northeastern Venezuelan homeland. Regardless, the key points to emphasize are that A, the Huecoid and Cedrosan solidoid material cultures indicate different degrees of social interaction with contemporaneous archaic groups, B, the Huecoid has a separate origin from that of the solidoid, and C, the subsequent Austinoid societies of Puerto Rico emerged as a result of such culturally and socially plural interactions. Among the artifacts found in archaic contexts are what can only be regarded as the oldest known prototypes of the three-pointed icons. This prototype was later in post salidoid huecoid times, after AD 700, evolve into the large, highly decorated iconic trogonoliths, or semi-icons, found in Puerto Rico and southeastern Hispaniola. The three-pointed semi-icons were found at Puerto Ferro on Vieques Island, a site dated between 2330 BC and 460 BC. They were made from the horn of the Strombus SPP, I'm not sure what that means, a marine conch. These small, simple three-pointers, made not only of shell but also of coral, have also been reported for a number of the Cedrosan Solidoid, 400 BC to AD 400 sites, throughout the Lesser Antilles, not just Puerto Rico. Interestingly, La Hueca and other related sites, example Hope Estate 1 in St. Martin and Morel 1 in Guadalupe, which Rouse grudgingly and incorrectly group in a Huecan solidoid subseries, have yet to yield three-pointed artifacts. Again, this points to significant differences in how the Huecoid and Cedrosan solidoid interacted with the archaic groups. The La Hueca-related artisans adopted archaic protocols of lithic reduction, whereas the Cedrosan solidoid adopted an artifact that would become one of the most ubiquitous religious icon icons of the Greater Antilles. The radical differences between Huecoid and Cedrosan Saladoid material cultures noted above do not imply that there were no commonalities between them. One refers to the paraphernalia used in religious rituals involving hallucinogens. It would appear that both the La Hueca and Hacienda Grande were already conducting rituals involving the inhalation of hallucinogens. Possibly Anaderantera Peregrina. Sadly, there is no direct archaeobotanical evidence as yet available to support this, inter this inference. And equally important, there is no evidence that can determine when in which psychotropic plants, such as evening primrose, a mild hallucinogen, first reached the Caribbean islands. Attempts by Queta Calle at the Institute of Archaeology to extract residues from drug inhalers have failed to produce results. The available evidence is indirect. Hacienda Grande style includes a small bowl with two spouts that were probably used for inhaling hallucinogenic powder. This bowl type is invari variably, invariably decorated with sewn incised cross-hatch designs. The La Hueca style vessel set also includes a bowl type with a pair of spouts for inhaling the hallucinogenic powder and is also decorated with sewn incised cross-hatch designs some filled with white or red pigment, as is almost all of the La Hueca style decorated pottery. Some of the latter are effigy bowls, depicting, for example, turtles, something that is absent in Hacienda Grande inhaling bowls. Although there are differences in zoned incised cross-hatching techniques between the Hacienda Grande, or Saladoid, and La Hueca, they both have a vessel type that fulfills the same function, to inhale the hallucinogenic powder. In terms of material culture, this is one of the few artifacts that are shared between the Huecoid and Saladoid, and just about everything else, they could not be further apart. It's assumed that the drug involved is cojoba, the seeds that come from the cojobana tree. On the basis of A, Spanish ethnohistoric documents describing cojoba and its psychotropic effects among natives in the Greater Antilles, and B, the paraphernalia used for inhaling the drug requires spouts or tubes for inhalation, also described by the Spaniards. This tree can still be found today in Puerto Rico and other islands. Other species of the genus Anadenantera are found from Central America to Northern Argentina and are still used in rituals by natives inhabiting Venezuela and the Guianas. <laughs>
For now, I adopt the view that A. Peregrina is the most likely source of hallucinogen used by Huecoid and Cedros and Saladoy groups, and leave the door open that the plant source may have entered into the Caribbean in archaic times from northeastern South America, or toroid, or perhaps from Central America, casmeroid. As Jeff Walker commented, it is very important to establish when the Cojovana tree reached the Caribbean because it makes a world of difference whether natives perceive their surrounding world through hallucinogenic experience in contrast to those using other means to achieve varying degrees of altered states of consciousness. Example, via tobacco, alcohol, dreams, or even music as in voodoo ceremonies, or to others who simply do not use any kind of stimulants. No doubt that the use of psychotropic drugs has profound effects in the religious art styles of the natives. The Saladoid and Huecoid 400 BC to AD 500 spouted ceramic bowls for inhaling were apparently discontinued by early period 3A in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. During period 3A, it seems only the Y-shaped snuffing tubes made of bird bones were in use. These were probably used much earlier, but thus far, because of their fragility, none have survived. It is clear that by later austenoid times, the piece holding the three inhaling tubes had become highly elaborated in some specimens. These tube holders, depicting anthropomorphic and zoomorphic personages, were sculptured in manatee bone, marine shell, or wood. Another variant of the standard Y-shaped inhaling device consists of a combined spatula for inducing vomit, an inhaler, and bears perforation indicating that it was also used as a necklace pendant. Two spatulas projecting from each side of the inhaler or tube holder represent the wings, with the tube holder at the center most frequently depicting a bat personage. Both the Cedroids and Saladoid 400 BC to 8500 and La Hueca 190 BC to 8500 have yielded the earliest known Macori type stone head prototypes. The Saladoid sample is made of shell, not stone, whereas the La Hueca sample is made of serpentine. Thus far, proto Macori's heads are absent from pre Arawak contexts. Still, its presence in early Saladoid and Huecoid contexts, like the miniature three pointed stones, indicate just how old these icons turned out to be. In time, the miniatures would evolve into large Makori stone heads. To summarize, the evidence strongly indicates that Rouse's early Osteonoi styles in Puerto Rico were not merely the result of a single line of development out of a Cedros and Saladoid ancestry, but stem from much more complex forms of interactions and exchanges between the archaic groups Cedros and Saladoid and Huecoid. The comparative examples discussed provide a flavor of the variable and selective nature of the adoption, mimicry, or transmission of techniques of tool manufacture, ceramic style and technology, and religious paraphernalia, three-pointers and hailing tubes, among these three blocks of populations. This can be further amplified by briefly reviewing settlement patterns, sedentism, and food procurement and production. Rouse's characterization of all archaic age subsistence economy as exclusively based on wild food procurement has recently been proven incorrect. The archaic age ground stone tools, including the distinctive cobble edge grinder sampled from Maruca and Puerto Ferro sites, have been subjected to standard residue analysis by Jaime Pagan Jimenez, with fascinating results. The stone tools analyzed from Maruca, Ponce, date between 1295 BC and 395 BC. The ones from Puerto Ferro in Vieques date around 700 BC. The starch residues indicate that three domesticated and several other cultivated and wild plants were processed at either or both sites. The domesticated plants are maize, zeamais, common bean or frijol, and manioc or yuca. The cultivated plants are the sweet potato, and two kinds of arrowroot, or yautia, while the wild edibles are the corroso palm, canavilla, canavalia bean, gruya or achira, yam or ñame, and the marungue. The latter is a, close, is a close relative of the guayiga, described by Fray Bartolomé de las Casas in the 1500s as the principal staple of the natives of Higüey, in eastern Hispaniola and, surprisingly, has turned out to be an important staple in Puerto Rico from archaic times until Spanish contact. Like manioc, zamia requires a complex set of procedures to eliminate the toxins, but unlike manioc, a root crop, 
The starch is concentrated in the trunk, which is mostly subterranean. At least some, if not many, of the archaic groups were, in effect, gardeners and horticulturalists who maintain a broad-spectrum diet, including domesticated plants, and who also managed forest resources such as coroso palm trees and possibly the marangue. Some of these plants, as noted by Pagan Jimenez and his colleagues, like avocado and maize, probably came from Mesoamerica. Others, like marangue and guayiga, seem to have come from contacts with the Isthmian region of Panama and Colombia. Still others, like manioc, seem to come from northern South America. The sources and implied contacts are thus circum-Caribbean and not just limited to the northeastern lowlands of South America. In sum, the archaic societies were not simple roaming bands of hunter-gatherers or forages, foragers described by Rouse. As Lee Newsom and Elizabeth Wing noted, the agricultural saladoid populations migrating into the Caribbean around 400 BC would encounter an already developed archaic cultivation, at least house gardens, system in place. The cultivars in use by archaic groups were most likely incorporated into the Cedrosan saladoid suite of plants, and with these, a variety of food recipes, perhaps even food taboos and restrictions, and other farming techniques. And one might also expect that the late archaic gardeners would, also, would have also adopted farming techniques and cultivars from the saladoids. The archaic populations were thus cultivators of domesticated plants, even though a substantial part of their diet still consisted of fishing, hunting, and gathering, and managing wild plants. It is for all of the above reasons that Rodriguez Ramos prefers to group these diverse groups as pre-Arawak rather than archaic, doing away with its connotations of antiquity or age, and their pre-ceramic non-agricultural status. In Puerto Rico, there is also evidence of post holes that suggest at least semi-permanent pre-Arawak dwelling structures. These post holes features Post hole features are not unlike those found that are associated with permanent saladoid and post saladoid residential structures in Puerto Rico. If one adds that some pre Arawak sites were deep, dense, and quite large in area and showed continuous refuse acclimation, accumulation, then there are far more sedentary than has been assumed by many until recently. Some sites, like Maruca, Ortiz, and Paso del Indio also have burial grounds, which is suggestive of a higher degree of sedentism and territoriality. Angostura, on the margins of the Manati River floodplain, clearly shows a semicircular distribution of four large, mounded, midden deposits surrounding a clear, low-debris central area, probably the community's plaza. The same description applies to the Guayabo Blanco site in western Cuba. This is a pattern that parallels many, parallels that of many, if not the vast majority, of the later Cedrosan saladoid right up to Chican Ostenoid village, village, blah, 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 village settlements on coastal and broad valley areas of Puerto Rico. My own experience visiting pre Arawak sites on the southern coast of Hispaniola is that, if anything, some of the sites are even larger in area than, say, Angostura although a lot more archaeology needs to be done to confirm or refute their status as fairly sedentary villages. In Cuba and Hispaniola, pre-Arawak sites had independently developed ceramic technology. Cuban archaeologists grouped a number of such pre-Arawak sites with pottery under the label of Proto Agricola, all of which Rouse had incorrectly labeled as Melakin or Mejican, Mejakin, Austinoid. These pre-Arawak groups with pottery predate by several centuries the appearance of late Cedrosan saladoid in eastern Hispaniola or early Austinoid in the rest of Hispaniola and eastern central Cuba. Indeed, the decorations of the pre-Arawak stone vessels of Hispaniola, example Curi el Porvenir, do resemble some of the decorate, decorative elements of their pottery, called el Cainito style, and seem to have been implicated in the transfer of some designs to the so-called Mediacan ceramic styles. It is even conceivable that a lot of what is now classified following Rouse as Mediacan in Hispaniola in Cuba is in fact a direct development from pre Arawakan ceramic styles. In Puerto Rico, too, Rodriguez Ramos reports finding pre saladoid huecoid pottery at Paso del Indio associated with the local pre Arawak component, with one context dated between 600 to 450 BC and another to AD 90. 
To summarize, the pre-Arawak societies were neither the simple, highly mobile bands subsisting on fishing, hunting, and gathering wild plants, nor did they vanish under the weight of the culturally advanced agricultural Cedrosan Saladoid populations. The rise of what Rouse called the Austinoid series of cultures owes its diverse character not only not to a single source, but to a plurality of sources. It is multi-authored. That results from different interactions between the original pre-Arawak residents, the Arawak-speaking Cedrosan Saladoid, and the as yet linguistically unknown, unknown Huecoid newcomers. The Austinoid of Puerto Rico was the product of more than 800 years of Saladoid, Huecoid, and pre-Arawak in coexistence. The early styles of the Austinoid series in Puerto Rico, according to Rouse, developed entirely from a Cedrosan Saladoid ancestry. Yet when one examines the full range of absolute dates, it becomes clear that the late Saladoid culture, represented by Cueva styles, Cueva style, completely overlaps with the range of dates assigned to Rouse's purported later developments, the quote-unquote pure Ostiones and Montserrat styles. Montserrat styles. Cueva style ceramics can in fact be found in varying proportions mixed in the same context with Ostiones or Montserrat styles at some sites, while in other sites only one or the other style is present. This is not always the result of mechanical admixture or post-depositional factors, as Rouse invariably assumed, but rather as a reflection that plurality predominates. The same phenomenon can be noted between the modified Ostiones and the Santa Elena styles. Their dates also overlap to a certain extent with the dates of purportedly earlier Ostiones and Montserrat styles. The situation in the neighboring Dominican Republic has not been well studied, partly because of a lack of sufficient radiocarbon dates, but my experience at the El Cabo site in the Huey region, Eastern Dominican Republic, suggests that much of the same is going on there as well. The so-called Estilo Intermedio, also named Macao, Punta, or Atajaviso, has been found in association with either or both the Anadel and Boca Chica styles with the later being the immediate precursor of the historic Taino pottery. In northwestern Hispaniola, the presumably earlier Mayak style, or Mayak and Austinoid series, has been found in the same stratigraphic context as the later Boca Chica, or carrier styles, and at contact period sites, such as around La Isabela. If Majak ceramics proved to have a, quote, pre arawak with pottery, end quote, ancestry, then it's more Dainio in designs and forms along with diagnostic Boca Chica style pottery found in the same context are indicative, again, that complex processes of social interaction are at work in the creation of Majak. These situations strongly suggest that instead of homo homogeneity, there is a plurality of styles that are variably used and deployed by different social groups within and between different localities at any one time. The range of chronological overlap in the, produ in the production and use of potteries of different styles at a site suggests that other social phenomena are at work rather than only continuous divergence from a single ancestral line. In Puerto Rico, and most likely also in the neighboring islands, marked changes began to take place in settlement patterns, demography, and material culture around 8,500 to 700. There were marked shifts in the configuration of the regional interaction spheres observed in previous times from ones that promoted the production and trade of shiny raw materials, both semi-precious stones and nacreous shells, and finished personal adornments, to the circulation of other emblems of social hierarchy and or ethnic identity within the island and in surrounding regions. These changes signal marked alterations in the ideological and economic structures upon which those interactions were articulated previously in Puerto Rico, the Antilles, and the Greater Caribbean. Around AD 500, quote, new identities began to be forged within the island, Puerto Rico, and reformulated in a context thus characterized by cultural and social plurality rather than homogeneity, end quote. This was a time span when village fission began to intensify on the long-established semicircular settlements of the coastal plains and when new avant-garde daughter settlements were established not only on the coastal plains and large interior valleys, but also in the interior high mountainous region. It is during period three, 
circa A.D. 700 to 1200, that the ubiquitous lithic collars and probably the large three-pointed icons began to appear in the archaeological record of Puerto Rico, eastern Hispaniola, and the Virgin Islands. It is possible that the elbow stones and the large macorostype stone heads also began at this time, although this is yet to be confirmed. Not only these, but other features indicate considerable changes taking place in all spheres of society and culture. These include what seems to be a ranked order of settlements. Some sites redefine their public space from an unmarked circular or semicircular central plaza to a quadrangular or rectangular space marked by monoliths. In some instances, another rectangular court area near the settlement was constructed. Presumably, the latter were dedicated to the Antillian rubber ball game. The plazas, or bates, were demarcated with limestone slabs or metavolcanic monoliths that were often decorated with petroglyphs that are nothing more and nothing less than monumental semi-icons. Ball courts, however, either lack petroglyphs or may have only one or two as terminal monuments. Plazas generally show an ensemble of, of petroglyphs. Sites that had only a single stone demarcated court, however, may have fulfilled a variety of functions, including ball games. The earliest known multi-court civic cer ceremonial site is found near Ponce in southern Puerto Rico. This site, Tibes, is found at the edge between the broad coastal plains and the limestone hill area north of Ponce, adjacent to the Portuguese River. Tibes began Cedrosian Solidoy times, 250 BC to 8600, as a settlement with an unmarked, perhaps round, central plaza within which a burial ground was found. Its semicircular configuration, based on the spatial distribution of Cedrosan ceramics, is not as clear as I once believed. Ongoing research directed by Antonio Curet has revealed that the Cedrosan solidoid period semicircular midden distribution is in part the result of redeposition that took place when the, preci when the precincts demarcated with stones were being constructed. Nevertheless, the central area where the main quadrangular precinct is located today seems to have always been a plaza and not a residential area. Radiocarbon dates suggest that the period of intense construction of plazas and ball courts occurred between AD 1000 and 8200. During this time, a large quadrangular plaza demarcated with stones was built, surrounded by a star-shaped precinct, a large rectangular court, and six other smaller rectangular precincts, all framed by monoliths. Only the main plaza contains petroglyphs. Shortly after A.D. 1200, for reasons as yet unknown, the site was essentially abandoned, although it apparently was visited by larger groups since Chicken Ostenoy ceramics had been found there in small numbers. One key change at Dives was the abandonment of the burial ground at the center of the unmarked plaza when it was redefined as a quadrangular plaza framed by monoliths. This change suggests that the various ceremonial activities in the central plaza were no longer linked with the ancestors' remains buried underneath. Rather, the focus shifted to the iconographic, iconographic personages engraved on several monoliths framing the central plaza. It has been hypothesized that this shift in mortuary practices is linked to a change from an egalitarian society to a stratified society. After AD 1200, when Chicken Ostenoid ceramic styles were in full bloom, multiple co court sites proliferated all over Puerto Rico. Tibes seems to have been replaced by, or perhaps even competed with, at least for some time, another multiple court site known as Hakana. Located in the Barayama sector, just four kilometers up the Portuguese River, Hakana is a recent discovery that will substantially contribute to our understanding of Puerto Rican pre-Columbian history. In 2006 to 2007, New South Associates performed archaeological work to mitigate any adverse impact of a planned dam and flood control project undertaken by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in a property managed by the Department of Natural Resources and Environment in Puerto Rico. At the time of this writing, there is strong public critique of the excavation methods and site management procedures. Nevertheless, given the site's importance and uniqueness, the Army Corps of Engineers had finally agreed to preserve it for future research. Prelim preliminarily, what is known thus far is that this site has one and likely multiple courts demarcated by monoliths. The main central plaza displays a complex iconography, as complex and elaborate as that of Caguana in Utuado. While Caguana has a limited residential occupation, i.e. it is not a nucleated village, Hakana shows a permanent and much longer occupation with at least five mounded middens. 
The occupation of Hakana probably began sometime between AD 400 and AD 700, based purely on the presence of deposits with early Cuevas, Montserrat, and Santa Elena style ceramics, and continued into period 4, AD 1200 to 1500, based on Capa style ceramics. If so, its early occupation overlapped with that of the early Elenin period occupation at Thebes, but Hakana seems to have continued to be occupied after Thebes' decline or abandonment. At PO 29, there is a partially uncovered main plaza measuring 40 by 50 meters, or 2,000 meters squared. Erect monoliths seem to enclose all four sides of the plaza, as is the case with, the very, with a few other Bate sites in Puerto Rico. Most unusually, seven monoliths found in the northern row displayed elaborately carved petroglyphs, whereas in all other well-known Bate sites, including Thibes and Caguana, the petroglyphs are found only on the eastern and western monolith rows. In the northern row, there is one particular petroglyph that is reminiscent of the two high-ranked anthropomorphic personages of Caguana, but, though, but whose head has been depicted sideward, as if detached from the body, perhaps decapitated? and resting on its shoulders. This personage is accompanied by a rounded face that is turned upside down and engraved below the main personage's body. The latter petroglyph head was clearly hidden from view as it would lie below the floor level of the court. Several others depict two pairs of opposing heads with one pair above ground, the other pair hidden under the plaza's floor, i.e. they are inverted heads looking up towards the surface. Near the center of this plaza, an excavated 121-meter square block area yielded 26 human burials with a predicted maximum of 430 inter interments for the plaza yet to be excavated. I would predict that this burial ground most likely predates the erection of monoliths around the plaza if indeed this site followed the same pattern noted for Thebes. Unlike Thebes, the pattern of midden deposits appears not to be arranged as a semicircle around the plaza. However, this may be due to a lack of intensive archaeological tests to the southwest of the site across a tributary creek. The physical proximity between Hakana and Thebes is particularly intriguing and raises key questions about the nature of political, religious power and territor territoriality, i.e. casigazos, in Puerto Rico. For example, if the two sites overlap during the time period when both had already constructed their multiple courts, circa AD 1000 to 1200, then it is possible that the political leaders controlling each site were in competition for the allegiance of the surrounding communities, not to mention economic resources. With only four kilometers separating the sites, it's hard to envision both being at the center of a hierar hierarchically ordered polity or a major chiefdom. This would beg the question of precisely what Caribbean archaeological archaeologists, including myself, mean by the word center in the term civic ceremonial center. In other words, if these two sites are contemporaneous, then they ought to be regarded as non-centers of a polity or of adjacent peer polities. However, it is just as possible, given the iconographic style of the monumental semi-petroglyph, Petroglyphs sculptured in a Tainoan art style, the Hakana arose as a civic ceremonial center as a consequence of Thebes' decline, circa AD 12,000, and it may have been implicated, not 12,000, 1200, sorry, and it may have been implicated in the declining fortune and eventual demise of Thebes. Thebes' iconography does stylistically antecede the style depicted in Caguana and hence that of Hakana. After the decline of Thebes, other civic ceremonial sites besides Hakana emerged elsewhere in Puerto Rico, not only on the coast, but also farther up in the highlands, such as at Palo Jincado, Batelles de Vivi, and Caguana, and on the north coast, example, Tierras, tier, blah, Tierras Nueva. <laughs> civic ceremonial sites with Batelles also sprung up in the up in southern and easternmost Hispaniola and in some of the Virgin Islands, such as St. Croix and Virgin Gorda. As populations moved from the coastal plains into the mountains of Puerto Rico, starting around AD 500 to 700, the settlement patterns no longer adhered to the ancestral semicircular villages of the coast. In the region of Caguana, Utuado, for example, the pattern developing from period 3B, AD 900 to 1300, to period 4, AD 1300 to 1500 
is one of dispersed farmsteads or homesteads, each with its own quote, end quote, front yard. Bate, or multifunctional plaza marked with monoliths and petroglyphs. These small homesteads were linked together through vacant courts located in possibly neutral areas between homesteads. Presumably, these vacant courts are where the Antillian ball games were held. The Antillian ball game, let us not forget, was not just a competitive sporting event, but was also, on solemn occasions, a highly charged religious ritual performance, as we shall see in part five of this book. Moreover, ball games were particularly important to the economy. Natives could bet large amounts of goods on the outcome of the game. On occasion, a human life could also be at stake and put up for betting. Winners would gain the right to kill the person, as several captive Spaniards would find out. Such bets, if dependent on pure chance, imply that they are not instances of reciprocal economic exchangers. Winners get all. Although it is probable, as game theory teaches, that in the end it can all even out. One could win as much as one could lose in the long run. It could well be that betting could only be done in favor of one's home team rather than on hedging the odds on a team with a better winning record. Sadly, the rules of betting in these times are unknown. In the midst of the dispersed farmsteads on the broader alluvial terrace of the Tanama River, the large multiple court site of Caguana had emerged around AD 1200, just about when Thebes had declined and, I suspect, when Hakana was in ascendancy on the southern coast. Such multiple precinct sites were able to hold much larger crowds for ritual performances and other public activities in their large central plazas and the surrounding smaller precincts. Multiple precinct sites thus appear to have functioned as civic ceremonial centers integrating or linking a network of dispersed farmsteads in the case of the highlands or surrounding nucleated villages in the case of coastal plains and broad interior valleys. The ups and downs, the rise and decline of these multiple court civic ceremonial sites are probably linked to shifting political alliances. I would argue that the shift in focus from buried individuals to icon iconographic representations of probably semiified ancestor personages was a factor in changing the dynamics of allegiances that groups had to a site where ancestors quote end quote resided. The practice of burying ancestors in the plaza was discontinued precisely to sever direct links between the actual buried persons and the living humans and was purposefully replaced by other means of constructing genealogical links to the civic ceremonial center. It would seem that ceasing to gather ancestors under the plaza would make it easier for surrounding community members to forward claims for membership in a given civic ceremonial site that no longer required physical proof by pointing to actual buried individuals. Quote, my relative is buried here, buried there, hence I belong, end quote. Instead, a symbolic, possibly fictitious kinship connection could be established to the site via the icons of ancestors or their avatars, i.e. semi-petroglyphs of bats, souls of the dead, etc., displayed in the plaza's monoliths. True descent reckoning can be politically manipulated to assert claims of membership to such and such site of quote-unquote origin and to other key features of landscape, like burial caves, without any reference to burials or iconography, but physicality is important. To be able to point to the tombs of one's ancestors matters, as it can be wielded as a forceful material evidence. The change from a focus on buried skeletons or bones of humans to ancestors and souls of the dead in iconographic form certainly marks a new way, though not the only way, of reckoning descent. It must be emphasized that it is not the only way, because burials were still conducted, but in many sites these were placed within midden deposits, i.e. behind and under houses, or in cave locations, but the deceased ancestors were no longer congregated as a quote-unquote community under the central plaza area. By removing the remains from the plaza and placing them under the house or in the household's funeral cave, the message seems to be one of appropriating the dead, of placing them under the control or care of a specific family and lineage of a given household. The society of dead ancestors is thus fissioned, segmented, and taken from the shared communal space of the site to the, to the periphery of individual domest 
domestic residences, and beyond to funeral caves. This is in sharp contrast to the earlier Saladoid period communally shared burial residence of the Society of Deceased Ancestors under the plaza. Elsewhere in Hispaniola, except the southeast, eastern Cuba, and Jamaica, the public spaces were expressed differently as none were stone demarcated rectangular or quadrangular batallas displaying a concentration of petroglyphs of ancestors and other potent personages. Instead, earth embankments were used at some sites, such as the Embasaling site in Haiti. Here, the settlement sprung up around a huge C-shaped central plaza marked with earth ridges, with which an elite structure, possibly a chief's gane, was erected on a mounted platform. It follows that the way in which social groups in these areas materially identified with or claimed adherence to a given civic ceremonial site and its leader or cacique differed considerably from that of southeastern Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, or the Virgin Islands, where smaller scale, smaller scale and stone demarcated batallas predominate. The above discussion provides only a glimpse of the complexity of social and cultural interactions that started around AD 500 and became even more complex from AD 1200 onward. The rise and decline of civic ceremonial centers and the implied demographic shifts cannot be explained solely in terms of stylistic typologies or merely by pointing to divergences from a homogenous ancestral culture or people. In Rouse's 1992 book, all of these diverse and complex manifestations are summed up as, quote, classic Taino, end quote. But such classification obscures what are substantial and significant differences in how people construct their group or ethnic identities and claim membership to a place. That the phenomenon of stone demarcated plaza, with its symbolic replacement of skeletons by monumental petroglyph semis, is tightly circumscribed to Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and southeastern Hispaniola, and is not a key feature of the rest of what Rouse called, quote, classic Tainos, end quote, or Chican Austinoid, is a strong argument to drop the classificatory concept. The daily affairs of sociality, politics, religion, economics, and so on were enacted and expressed differently in, say, Puerto Rico than in northwestern Dominican Republic or eastern Cuba. This is not a matter, as Rouse proposed, of a progressive degradation or simplification by a diffusion or migration of the Taino culture as one moves away from the core and into the eastern or western peripheries, but primordial, primordially of complex processes that create and recreate new identities within and between villages, regions, and islands, identities and allegiances reformulated in an environment characterized by cultural and social plurality not homogeneity. I do not yet have enough evidence, but I have strong suspicion that the coincidence of two fairly differentiated ceramic styles, example, Santa Elena and quote-unquote modified Ostiones or Capa and Esperanza, found in some, if not many, archaeological sites of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, may be a reflection of the shifting allegiances to civic ceremonial centers. When centers are in decline for whatever reason, example, death of its ruler, military conquest, or even the theft of a chief's powerful set of semi-idols by competitors, the surrounding population will ultimately shift its allegiance, and often its residence, elsewhere, to a more promising, ascending civic ceremonial center, and to a leadership they would trust or risk trusting. To ease a new claim of membership to an emerging civic ceremonial center, where one actually has no buried ancestors, Changing how one reckons ancestry to iconographic representations of ancestors seem to be an effective means of recruiting new members by the emerging leadership. The demographic and settlement pattern shifts documented by Antonio Curret and Jose Torres for Puerto Rico have less to do with population pressures on economic resources and much more to do with the changing winds of native political and social relations of which the rise and decline of civic ceremonial sites is its most visible symptom. However, the rise of, a new, of new centers does not necessarily entail that they will exhibit a greater degree of complexity in linking settlements than those that preceded it or those that are in decline. The temporal cycling between more centralized and expansive polities and decentralized and less expensive ones is something noted in other areas of the New World, such as the southeastern United States. 
As I will discuss later, the ensembles of numinous icons imbue with semi-potency, example, from portable three-pointed stones to fixed monumental petroglyphs that were, quote, owned, end quote, by caciques and other political elites, are at the heart of these shifts and changes of allegiance. Religion is not just a passive, suprastructural ideology to justify the status quo of leaders, but is rather actively involved in conditioning human actions, decisions, and certainly casually implicated in the shifting allegiances from one declining civic ceremonial center to an ascending one, as much as in maintaining allegiances between peer, but potentially competitive, civic ceremonial centers. Most scholars, myself included, agree that period three, AD 600 to 1300, signals the development of complex stratified societies, but beyond that, there is little consensus as to their specific character, some would have single to multiple tiered hierarchical chiefdoms developing throughout the Greater Antilles and into Rouse's Eastern Taino area. Others suggest that paramount chiefdoms existed only in Hispaniola and then were applicable to only one or another of the Hispaniola polities. Still, others argue for polities resembling something more like the, quote, big men, end quote, or quote, great big men, end quote, Melanesian models, that all caciques were local, quote-unquote. Certainly, the ethno-historic data points to substantial differences in levels of socio-political organization within and between eastern Cuba, Hispaniola, the Bahamas, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. What is clearer is that Hispaniola's chiefdoms, whether or not this is the appropriate term, were more complex and centralized than in Puerto Rico, at least by the time of Spanish contact. The Spanish did refer to the native political entities as casicazos, a word that has been co-opted by scholars in order to refer to chiefdoms in the classic sense of Elman service or Julian Stewart. But the term cacique among the Locono, Guyana, Arawak speakers, simply translates as a male or female head of the house. It equally refers to the head of a family, a lineage, or a co-residential group as much as it refers to an a apical, apical leader of an entirely of an entire polity. They are all caciques. In Hispaniola, Bishop Las Casas identified degrees of seniority among caciques throughout a set of three words of deference used when addressing a senior leader. Matungeri was reserved for the highest ranking cacique, akin to saying your highness. Bahari was used for second ranking caciques, akin to saying your lordship, while guacheri or wajeri was used to address the third racking persons, perhaps local caciques or nitaino. A fourth term also used to address high ranking persons was guamiquina or wamiquina or guamaheji or wamaheri. This term is recorded for both Hispaniola and Puerto Rico. Wamiquina is a compound of our lord, wama, and principal or first, ikini, which derives from the word for number one, heketi. This term was also used when addressing strangers of high rank, such as Christopher Columbus. Such distinctions of deference and rank do not necessarily translate directly into three hierarchical political structures, political structure consisting of paramount caciques and chiefdoms and second and third tiered caciques and their smaller subordinate, subordinated cacigazos. As Wilson deftly argued, although a few caciques were principal lords in Hispaniola, example, Bejequio of Bainoa, Zaragua, or Guarionesh in Magua, Gayabo, their political power and authority were hardly those of an absolute ruler or despot. Thus, the subordination of other caciques seems to be more a matter of contestation and political wheeling and dealing than is generally recognized. The complex nature of relations among chiefs and their rank vis-a-vis -vis other caciques with varying disagrees of centralized authority will be addressed later in this book when we analyze how human political power is brokered through the deployment of powerful semi-icons. Suffice it to say that the classic definitions of hierarchically ranked chiefdoms are inadequate for describing the, diver the diverse nature of the cacicasos in the Greater Antilles. Probably heterarchy should be considered more seriously. I think there are some useful insights to be drawn from how hierarchical and heterarchical powers operate among Zinguano polities in Brazil and how head 
heterarchy in particular might also work to explain the cases of, quote, peer and quote, casigazos in, for example, Puerto Rico. There is some consensus that the more complex polities at the time of Spanish contact, those that seem to suggest a centralized power in a hierarchical organization, apply only to some, not all, of the casigazos of Hispaniola. In Puerto Rico, including Mona, Vieques, Culebras, and Croix Islands, it is generally acknowledged that the casigazos there were rather smaller and best seen as peer polities. That is, there was either an absence of or far less emphasis or instability on the centralization and hierarchical organizations or subordination to a paramount cacique. Eastern Cuba and Jamaica are regarded in a similar way, but there are dissenting voices. For example, Roberto Casa argues against the presence of hierarchical chiefdoms in Hispaniola, whereas John Crock and James Peterson see classic chiefdoms even in the small outlying islands, island group of Anguilla, St. Martin, in the northeastern Lesser Antilles. If one reads the discussion of chiefly descent roles by William Keegan, or the comparative study of Oaxaca Taino chiefdoms by Elsa Redman and Charles Spencer, it's evident that they assume the Taino Casigazo fits into the classic description of a chiefdom type a la service or steward. If I have not discussed in any depth the archaeological evidence to evaluate the nature of pre-Spanish contact Caribbean chiefdoms, it is simply because there is not much to put one's hands on. The various existing arguments on the nature, complexity, and diversity of chiefdoms, or even whether there were any chiefdoms at all, almost entirely rest on how the 16th century Spanish documents were interpreted. Furthermore, to extract useful data from the Spanish chronicles, only the brief periods between AD 1492 and 1504 for Hispaniola and between AD 1508 and 1510 for Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica would be useful to gain some sense of native political organization before the onslaught of the Spanish conquest. After these dates, the native political structures were no longer operational. Moreover, the evidence required to assess social stratification has not been archaeologically documented, and yet such, date, such data are, at least for me, the minimal precondition to even consider questions about comp complex polities, including chiefdoms. No one has yet produced data on the composition of a household, of household economy, or whether different houses and households in a village have access to more resources than others. As I see the situation now, what we have is like a large 100,000-piece puzzle of which only a number of bits here and there are in place, still without having the foggiest idea of what the final picture looks like. This is not to say that in the Caribbean, archaeologists are not designing and conducting archaeological projects towards this end, but that the results at the necessary temporal and spatial scales to peek into the changing structures and processes of sociopolitical socio formations have yet to come. All right, guys, I think this is actually a good stopping point because the rest of chapter two is a couple of more pages and we've already gone over an hour. So we'll stop here and start back um, with the next video on chapter two, part C, from Taino peoples to the Tainoness of peoples.